Thank you, Reverend Stanley. And th thank you, Reverend Stanley. And thank God for each of you who are on the phone line and the Zoom line tonight. Reverend Stanley, mute your phone. I'm muted. Oh, somebody got me. I got a little reverb. Who doing the line tonight? There we go. Got it. It's good to see everybody tonight on the on the phone line. I'll hear your voice on the phone line and see you on the Zoom line. <clears throat> We're grateful tonight. Had another beautiful day. Oh, we had a great time at the church today. Uh, the deacons had a great time. I had a great time with them. And the mothers were over there working and the uh, ministers. We had a good meeting today. And I'm just grateful again to be the service of Pastor St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, we, um, M M Reverend Ed, was you mission today, but we know why you weren't there. And so your, your brothers and sisters in Christ are, are praying for you and Deacon Edwards. And so no, we miss you, but we know where you are. Uh, so you have an excuse. You had an excuse after today. Um, we're grateful tonight to be in the Word of God again. The Word of God is mighty powerful. It's powerful. It's all powerful. The Word of God is mighty true. It's all. It's all true, and it's it all is again suited to our, to reprove us, to rebuke us, and to exhort us. And so tonight we're here uh, to again uh, get into the Word of God. In First chapter, First Thessalonians chapter four, and it's interesting. I had an opportunity uh, to preach this today at a home going celebration. Uh, a little bit later in this verse, and I don't know if we're going to get that far today, but uh, in chapter four, we have learned and Paul gave some commands that were connected to um, what he said at the end of chapter three. And so at the end of chapter three, you remember that Paul says um, that his desire uh, was that the, in his prayer was that God increase, the Lord make the increase, is verse 12, and abound in love one to another. In other words, his prayer was, first of all, that God would allow the love that the Thessalonians had to abound toward one another and then to all men. And then he says that he wanted the result of that love that was abounding between one another and to other men would establish the hearts unblameable in holiness. Holiness is what he said um, before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So three things. He wanted love to increase. He wanted the hearts to be established and unblameable in holiness before God. And finally, he wanted that, that readiness, that holiness uh, to be revealed at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And that was the first time, interesting enough, but it wasn't the last time in this book that, that Paul said with his saints. In other words, uh, Paul uniquely, in my estimation, uh, connected <clears throat> the return of Christ with saints. In other words, uh, he, he made it very plain that connected to Jesus Christ coming with saints and the saints who had died in Christ were connected to the second coming of Christ. And he's going to talk about a little later in this chapter. But it's something, isn't that good to think about that 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 as if as those who we have loved who who lived in Christ will come back with Jesus. I don't know if I ever saw it as clear as clear as I did today when I was preaching it. Jesus is coming back with his saints, with mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers, children, aunts and uncles, cousins, nephews, deacons, mothers, preachers we love. And, and, and he's coming with them. And so the challenge for us is understanding that for us to walk in readiness of the coming of Christ. You got me? So if somebody says, so-and-so is coming over, you're going to be ready because you want to see so-and-so and you get your step, step together. And that's what Paul is saying to the church at Thessalonica. And I want to be clear, they didn't. it wasn't like they had some bad report. He was just telling a group of Christians who had walked by faith, lived in faith, who had trusted the Lord, who had demonstrated love for the Lord and love for God's people. He just told them to stay ready, be ready, walk in the readiness so that there won't be any reticence, any nervousness as a result of waiting on the coming of Christ. And so in that theme, he moves on to chapter four, verse one. And he says, furthermore, in other words, in addition to that, which I desire, he said, I'm begging you, brethren, and I exhort you, I encourage you by the Lord um, Jesus, by the Lord Jesus, that uh, if you are, as ye have received of us how we ought to walk, as you have seen how we walk and have heard preached to you uh, how to walk, he said, in a way to please God, we we want you to abound more and more. In other words, you're doing a good job, but keep on doing a good job. Be better. Um, sometimes I look at athletes. You know, I watch a lot of sports, but I'm always impressed by uh, an athlete that comes to lead with, with with natural talent, but continues to work hard on their natural talent. You, you can look at any sport in basketball. You would have Michael Jordan. LeBron James and, and football, you might have Tom Brady and, and others in and, and baseball. You might have, um, I don't watch baseball. Um, you, you might you might have uh, some guy who's just, he's 45 years old and he's still at the same level. That's because they worked at what they had. They continued, they pushed themselves. They, they maximized their capabilities by continuing to work with what they had been given. The church in Thessalonians had come into Christ. They had received salvation. 
But he said that he wanted them to, to keep on working on it, to abound in it, to let their salvation be secure. Um, but let them enjoy it. That's what he was trying to say. Enjoy your salvation. Now, in verse two, he says, for we know what commandments you, we gave you by the Lord Jesus. He said, you know what word we gave. And he said, use the word commandments to let them know that it wasn't something that just he and Paul and Silas said. He wanted them to understand it was what the Lord had said. Verse three, he says this, and this is a part of that readiness, a part of that enjoyment of the life that God has given us. He said, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Hey, he said, I want you to be separate. And again, we talked about this last night, but I double I come back at it again. The church at uh, Thessalonica was a, was a group of people. The, the church at Thessalonica, of course, was in Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a city that was affected by uh, carnality. The, the first part was there was a city that was really literally full of what they considered to be intellectuals and smart people. And it was a great place of commerce. And so their worldliness came and resided in Thessalonica. Paul's encouragement was that they not abide in the worldliness or the carnality that was present in the city of Thessalonica. And so he says, it's God's will that you are set apart, that you are sanctified. That when people look at you, they don't look and see the world. They look and see the Christ in you. And in doing so, Paul moves on to the second part of the chapter of verse three. They said, you should abstain from fornication. Now, understand that fornication actually went multiple ways, but the, the primary thing he's going to talk about here in, in verse three is sexual sin. And that's sin outside of the bondage which God has given. So understanding that, he says that you should abstain from that. And then he answers the question that we might ask why. Paul said, because every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Again, his point was this. In our vessel, that's our bodies, we should, it should be sanctified and honored. That's A. B, he says, not and let not our lives be driven by the lust of concupiscence, even the Gentiles which know not God. Paul said it was a characteristic of the Gentiles to have no control, no desire for control over their lives in their physical bodies uh, as related to sexual sin. And so he said, don't be like the world, is what he's saying. He says, because in doing so, verse 6, that there may be frauding. Of, of, of others we may defraud others in our behavior and i, I used this example last night my grandmother used to say that somebody who is still a kill paul is saying anybody who would, would operate in this way is subject to doing something wrong something defrauding somebody else and he reminds the lord is the avenge of all such who mistreat others as we have also forewarned you and have in fact testified now verse seven he gives another reason for the need to live in sanctification for god has not called us uncleanliness but unto holiness. Again, our call as Christians is to holiness. Uh, verse 8, he said, he therefore that despised the despised not man, but God. He said, the sin is not against man, but the sin is against God, since God has given in verse 3 the, the command to, to be sanctified and abstain from fornication. And he says also that God has given us his Holy Spirit to strengthen us that we may withstand or, or not fall prey to that which is wrong. Now, that's what we we did that last night, so I wanted to just review it. Now, that's the first set of lessons uh, that Paul has given the church at Thessalonica and us and how we can live in a readiness for the coming of Christ. Now, in verse 9, here's what he says. Also, he asks this to it, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. One of the things that I mentioned at that funeral today uh, was the re reality of the necessity of brotherly love. The Christian in order to live ready for the coming of Christ, has to operate in a level of, no, as I said, they're wrong. Not a level, but has to have to operate in brotherly love. It's not like it can be measured. No, we need to operate in brotherly love. That's why he says, if what he's saying, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, it's touching brotherly love. And he said, let me touch on it for a minute. You don't need that I'm writing to you. I don't need to tell you again. He said, because you are taught of God to love one another. Paul says, you learned it the first go around. You know that to be true. And you have loved one another. And so you've been taught this, but you need to remember that brotherly love is important. And I'm, I'm going to be like Paul tonight. We done, in these last two years, we done talked about brotherly love in at least four books of the Bible. And not to mention other places we discussed it biblically. But brotherly love is not something that's optional for the child of God. It's not optional for the Christian. It's not optional for the church. The church has to demonstrate, operate in, in brotherly love. John had the longest discourse on brotherly love, letting us know that by basically by the fact that we love each other it demonstrates we are children of God. And so understanding that, like Paul says the same thing to us. You, St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church family and friends, are taught of God to love one another. What is he saying? It's in the word of God. Paul said, I've written it to you. I've said it. I've preached it to you. And I'm standing here today in 2022 says, you've read it. I've taught it. I've preached it. 
I, I we, we, and, and that we should live in a place where we share brotherly love one to another. In other words, don't you sit and wait for somebody to love you. You, you institute and initiate love, um, love for your brother and your sister out of your own heart. I think I told y'all this story one day. I was talking to somebody. This is I've been pastor. Somebody was like, Pastor Thomas, so and so didn't speak to me. They walked right by me and speak to me. And I said, Oh, well, what happened? And I said, um, they said they just walked by me to say nothing. I said, What you say? I ain't say nothing either because I thought they were speaking to me. There's the problem. Now, if you speak to somebody and they don't speak to you, then that's on them. But if you sitting there waiting on them to speak and they don't speak and you don't speak, then that's on you. That's not brother love. And see, brother love means that you love, you ain't waiting for them to love you, you're loving them. My friends often tease me about uh, the fact that sometimes if everybody's eating, I sit at the table and I'll be waiting on somebody to bring me a plate. Now, I'm blaming that on St. Peter Baptist Church, okay? That's y'all fault. <laughs> because as many plates as I've been brought over the last 18 years, wherever I go, I'm expecting somebody to show up with a plate. But the reality is the behavior of the Christian shouldn't be like that. So I'm gonna start going at my plate, but not today. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go get my plate soon enough, though. But the behavior of the Christian is not to wait on love to come to us. Our job is to do what? Share love with others. Y'all got me? And that's, and that's what he's saying about brother love. Brother love ain't waiting to be the love. You, you, you give it off love. Sometimes we don't get along with each other because we're waiting on somebody to love on us. Love on them. Amen. Love on them. Amen. And see what happens. That's what he's saying. He said, y'all know better. Now look at verse 10. He said, in the deed. If you do it toward all the brethren, which in all in Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, ye increase more and more. Paul said, you love, you love your neighbors. That's what he's saying, because Macedonia was nearby. He said, but I want you to do more than love just to folk in Macedonia. I want your love to be expressed. And I actually can see this now. I can see it now. That the 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 pie, and sometimes I think about this. Well, how did the new church grow? You know, they didn't have TV, they didn't have Facebook, they didn't have Instagram, they didn't have radio, they didn't have cell phones, they had text messages, they didn't have emails. How did church grow? It grew because people showed brotherly love. That's how it grew. People showed brotherly love. People showed love to one another. So if you can imagine church in Thessalonica love each other, somebody builds in Thessalonica and say, man, I want to go to Thessalonica. They love each other. And then somebody took that love back to Macedonia and somebody started loving. They said, well, where did you get that from? Well, the brothers and sisters in Christ over in Thessalonica love each other. We all do the same thing. And, and people in Macedonia then will come to know Christ. Why? Because of the fact that there was so much love. Remember that. Without Facebook, without Instagram, without TV, without radio, without text messages, without emails, love, the church grew out of the on the basis of brotherly love he says you have done it but he said i want you to do it more beseech you brother you increase more and more that the love that you have brotherly love and remember the love of god is vertical that means we experience god's love we love him back but god is telling us through paul here to let it go horizontal let it go out let it go out let it go out and he said keep on doing it don't in other words don't pick a group of people you love and that's it let there always be more and more people that you show love for in Jesus Christ. Y'all y'all got me with that? I remember I was talking to somebody the other day. Well, it's been a year or so now. I should say the other day, but it was a year or so. I was talking to somebody. I said, you know, you become a good friend of mine. I said, I thought I had, I had a closed circle. I wasn't making no more friends. I said, but here you come. And I thought about it. They ain't the behavior of the Christian. The Christian got to be open to whoever God sent us to show them love. Y'all with me on this? We gotta, that's, that's the position we have. I don't care if you got 100 friends and 400 cousins. There's still a position in which we can share the love of God with others. And that's what Paul is saying here in verse 10. I'm saying it to y'all. Let our love increase more and more. Now, in verse 11, so he's done two things, sexual sin and love. Now, in verse 11, he picks it up and takes it a little bit further. He says, and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business. Now, let y'all got to hear this one now. This from me too. And to work with your own hands as we command you. Now, let me take my time. This might be all I get to tonight. Paul says you study to be quiet. When he says study, he's not saying that you read a book on how to be quiet. What Paul is saying ostensibly is that you make it a point to be quiet. What does that mean? Not be argumentative because on the heels of Christian love is behavior with one another. So in other words, if you love one another, then what happens is uh, as you love one another, um, your behavior should demonstrate it. All right. And so as you demonstrate the love, one of the things is not always to be into it with somebody. Y'all know folks who say, I love my neighbor. And then they're always into it with somebody. Y'all know anybody like that? Well, maybe y'all don't do because I do. I know a couple people like that. So they're always into it with somebody. Being quiet means that sometimes you just swallow your pride. Being quiet means sometimes 
you choose not to argue. Being quiet means you choose not to get somebody back. Being quiet means you choose to be introspective as opposed to uh, 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 an external threat to others. He said, study, make it your point to be quiet. And I know it's hard because sometimes we want to say something. Sometimes somebody just make us mad. But Paul said, that's not demonstrative of brother love. Study to be quiet. Now this next part, I'm going to read it. Then I'm going to do a 2022 on it. And to do your own business. So here go 2022. Mind your own business. Can I say that? Do I need to say any more? I'm going to say a little bit more. Mind your own business means that you're not in somebody else's business. Uh, I think that in in, in in First Peter, I believe chapter 2, there's a, con a concept that he presented about how what we need to leave behind. And that was being a busybody. That means that you are in somebody else's business. And you know what happens when you get in somebody else's business, right? You tell somebody else about somebody else's business. Y'all know what I'm talking about. No, everybody don't look, don't look off. We know what that means. We know what it looked like. Now, I ain't saying y'all did it, but we know what it looks like. That you uh, find out what somebody else do, and then you tell somebody else what they were doing. Paul says that is not indicative of brotherly love. If you uh, don't agree with what somebody's doing, brotherly love makes you do what? Talk to them about it. Brotherly love don't mean that you get a text thread and text somebody else about it. Nah, and I mean, I'm saying it to, I'm speaking to Pastor Thomas too, that Paul says we ought to be quiet and then he says, we ought to mind our own business. Now, that's essential because, again, it's an offshoot of brotherly love. Now, let me go. On. I'm going to go a little bit more. He says, and to work with your own hands. Now, Paul says and reminds them that when he came to meet them uh, and the first time in Thessalonica, that, that and we, we read this early in this letter. Paul says, when I came there, y'all didn't have to do nothing for me because I worked all day with y'all. And then at night, I taught the gospel and preached the gospel. And Paul is saying, we were not a burden on you. I want y'all to hear this from me. And I'm not talking to y'all. I'm really talking to the choir, but I want y'all to hear this so that we understand better the interaction we should have with people. He says, I want, I, I, I work with you. I, I use my own hands. I was not a burden to you in any way. In other words, Paul says, y'all were happy to see me come because y'all know I, wouldn't, I, didn't, wouldn't, I didn't want nothing from you. I worked with you. I had my own check. I did what I needed to do. Paul says, and I want you to understand that it's important that we work with our own hands. Do our part. Now, doing our part is, you know, if you can work, work. If not, you get whatever, you know, means of income you have. But what it means is that when people see you coming, they they want to teach. And if, some, if you're a teacher, when people see you coming, they want to hear. And, and and doing your own part as well means this. Doing your own part or, uh, or use your, working your own hands means even in ministry, that that's people ought to do their part. I said this before and I'll say it again. In most ministries, 40% of the work, I'm sorry, yeah. 40% of the work, no, 100% of the work is done by 40% of the people. That's what I want to say. So that means as you look around on, on a, any given Sunday, there are about 60% of the people. If there's 100 people, 60%, 60 people are just sitting there coming back and forth to the church. They're not doing their part. I'm going to pause here. I'm going to pause right here and take a deep breath. Today, we were having a conversation in our minister's meeting. We were talking about the need for people to, and I, and I don't even want to use the volunteer because when you're doing something in church, that's not volunteer work. Volunteer work is when you go, um, I don't know, go down in NWCP or somewhere. When you're a part of the body of Christ, it ain't volunteer work. That's 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 service. That's ministry. All right? And so we were talking about the need to have, and I'm going to go ahead and say it. We were talking about the need um, to have um, individuals who work with the Sunday school, and not just as teachers. We were talking about the need to have somebody who comes in and helps work the lines for the because uh, we're about to go virtual on YouTube. We need somebody to come work the computer. We need somebody to help move the microphones around. And yeah, we got a couple people to do them, but if some other folk can do it, we should a church the size of St. Peter shouldn't have a handful of folk doing all the work. Everybody needs to do their part. And and, and I'm, I'm expressing this because you're anybody who's saying I ain't gonna do nothing, you're missing out. And so as pastor, I can't let you miss out. The same way that I don't want you to miss out on salvation, I don't want nobody to miss out on the joy of serving. Because I, anybody out here that have served the Lord, you serve the Lord, you love it, and make it feel joy, can you, can you raise your hand? I, if you're not in ministry serving the Lord, you're missing out on the joy of service, serving the Lord. That's a joy in serving the Lord. And so Paul says in here, um, um, work, you work with your hand, do your part. Now, here's what I want y'all to do, because I'm talking to folk who do their part, Okay. But when somebody, you see somebody, and I, I don't care if it's your cousin, your friend, your brother, sister, mom and dad, sister, child, son or daughter, tell them you got work to do for the Lord if they in Christ. And so we, we shouldn't have to outsource anything because God has blessed us with all that we need to do his work. Now, I don't want y'all to think that Pastor Thomas is not a priest. I am a priest. And I'm preaching about how we learn to give. I am. Now I want us to learn to serve. 
Is that too hard? Is that too much for me to ask? Y'all, y'all gonna let me be past a little bit longer? Okay, just let me stay a little while longer. But we we getting somewhere. We on fire. But just like Paul said at the Church of Corinth, I mean Thessalonica, you on fire, but burn burn brighter, burn brighter. That's what he's saying. That's what he means when he says, and we as uh, work with your own hands as we commanded. I'm gonna hit this last verse. I'm gonna stop. He said that we may walk honestly toward them without. Now that's back to that first clause about taking care of yourself, doing your part for you. He says. Paul said the reason why we were able to walk honestly, the reason why we were able to connect with you and you were able to connect with me, because we did our part, we used our own hands. And he said we were able to walk honestly toward them that, that are without. That means we were able to actually help somebody who actually needed some help. And the, he said that we may have lack of nothing. See, that was a sense of communion. No, that was a sense of community in the church at the, at the, at the church at Thessalonica. They helped each other. So nobody was sitting there depending on somebody else to give them anything. And secondarily, nobody was sitting there waiting on somebody to do their part. That, that's what was happening. And so as a result, Paul is simply encouraging them to continue in that vein so that they could be the church that was they were, a strong church of the Lord. Sometimes when we get to a certain place, people say, well, um, well, you know, um, I've done enough in my life. Well, I, the, I remember the song that says, I'm going to stay on the battlefield. How long? Till I die. It didn't say I'm going to stay on the battlefield as long as it's convenient until I get tired. It says I'm going to stay on the battlefield till I die die and so the work of the christian goes on it may change but it's still your work to your ministry to do what god has called you to do he said i want you to walk honestly um that we that, that, that we may walk honestly toward them that are without that they may have lack of nothing lack of nothing um we shouldn't be looking around to help folk to help the help and focus in, in, inside of us in the, in the congregation we shouldn't be looking around trying to figure out draft folk to do stuff they should be already standing up and say hey what can i do one of the biggest things that touched me last year is when after one service um I was one I remember was young, young well, he's younger than me. Uh Derek Green said, he said, you know what? The Lord told me to help with this right here. And it touched my heart because he didn't say I decided. He said, Lord told me. And I believe the Lord talked to some other people about what you need to be doing. And, and I want us to be as a as a group of strong Christians to encourage people. Years ago, I told some people, I said, Well, you, you know, I want you to be on every ministry. And the reason why I said that wasn't because I didn't want people doing ministry. The reason why I said that because there are other people who need to step up. And as long as we're doing it, a lot of folk will watch us. All right, I'm finna close. And so all Paul is saying here to the church at Thessalonica, all he is saying to us is to be ready for the Lord. We have to do these things, sexual I mean, purity, sanctification. We have to have brother and sisterly love. And finally, we need to be quiet, do our, do mind our own business and work with our own hands, do our part that we may walk honestly, that we may walk honestly toward them that don't have and that we may have lack of nothing. I love that part. In other words, what, what Paul is saying is we serve the Lord as we give our best, we ain't gonna lack nothing. I, I've learned that too. As we give to God, we lack nothing. We don't lack joy, we don't lack peace, we don't lack stuff as we give our very best to the Lord. I'm gonna stop tonight, and I didn't mean to take y'all this long. I messed around, took y'all to 728. I was trying to give y'all a break, but it didn't work out. But uh, I'm grateful tonight for your presence, and I thank God for each of you, and I pray tonight as we close out that we'll wake up tomorrow, March first Sunday. So if you're gonna come to church, come on to church. We look forward to seeing you. We're gonna be safe. And if you can't come, get your get your crackers and your juice now, so that we can celebrate communion together tomorrow, the first Sunday in the month of April, 2022. Again, I can't. I don't have to tell you. God has brought us a long way already. In a world of confusion, in a world of, of of chaos, God has given us peace while the world has gone to pieces. God bless you, and I love you. Let us pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. We come tonight and say thank you for your word again that just continuously strengthens and clarifies for us how we ought to live for you. I pray God tonight that your word will get in our, in our hands and feet that we can in fact serve you better and not think about how serve you better, but that we can serve you better. Let your word get in our hearts that we may be strengthened in our inner man. Let your word, dear God, get in our, in, in, in our let, let it get in, in our ears that we can hear your word over the winds of the world. And dear Lord, let your word get on our minds, in our minds, that we might have peace that surpasses all understanding, and that the fiery darts of Satan will be quenched. Let your word get on our lips, let it get on our tongues, let it get in our throats, let it get on our vocal cords and lungs, that we may declare your word to the dying world, to each other, and to ourselves. God, we love you, and I pray that every household, every family, and every individual believer tonight is blessed because of their willingness to hear your word. We love you, God. We so do, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, St. Peter. Hold on, Zoomers. God bless you.